भद्रम कर्णे शृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्ये मक्षजत्रा स्थिरंगुष्टुवागुम सस्तनु व्यशेम देवित यदा स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्वेदा स्वस्ति नस्ताक्षो अरिष्टनेमी स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओ शाति 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 So we have uh, completed the first chapter of the four chapters of Mandukya Karika. Today we will take a uh, look back. I think last time I had mentioned that there is a nice metaphor for revision. It's called the um, Singha Valokana Nyaya. In a forest. The lion is supposed to stride through the pace through the forest, stride through the forest, and once in a while majestically look back. So, so you are the lion. You're going to look back upon what we have done so far. Um, and this is very, very important. Once in a while to stop and look back. I remember um, in Haridwar, I used to attend classes, a traditional way Vedanta is taught there. So you go and sit near the teacher and classes go on. But they stop every fortnight, every 15 days there is a revision and there the revision is that's when the teacher gets a break. So they will select one of the students and that student has to come and summarize what was done in the last 15 days. Their classes are held every day. So uh, that's the day all the students are a little <laughs> nervous <laughs> and they have to prepare and nobody knows who's going to be selected to come and give the talk on the 15 days of Rama. Rama? <laughs> No, I, I won't do that now. Um, so if I do that, the next revision, the class will dwindle very fast. <laughs> yeah, uh, there are exams also. Um, we don't have that here, because the class will disappear if, if we start examinations. Um, the, I remember in the training center where we are taught the exams are, um, once you complete a text, there's an exam. Sometimes for long texts like this, there's something in between a quiz or an examination. And uh, that always irritates the novices. That for, you know, we've come to become monks, studies and exams all over again here. <laughs> and the marks are given grades. And But the real exam is whether you're enlightened or not, and that's internal. Before we uh, take a look at what we have done, let's chant the, uh, the, not the whole first chapter, but just the Upanishad, the 12 mantras of the Upanishad. Let's just chant the 12 mantras, and uh, then I will summarize the entire teaching which we have done till now. So I'll go mantra by mantra. Mantra of the Upanishad, not the Karikas. So this Upanishad has 12 mantras. Let's take the 12 mantras. Mantra 1. Please chant after me. Om Ittyeta Daksharam Om Ittyeta Daksharam Idagum Sarvam Tasya Upavyakhyanam Tasya Upavyakhyanam Bhutam bhavad, bhutam bhavad, bhavishyaditi, bhavishyaditi, sarva mongkada eva, sarva mongkada eva, yachanyat, yachanyat, trikalatitam, tadapyongkada eva, tadapyongkada eva, Sarvagam Hietad Brahma 
अयमात्मा ब्रह्मा सोयमात्मा चतुष्पा जागरित स्थानो बहिष्प्रज्ञा जागरित स्थानो बहिष्प्रज्ञा सप्तांग एको न विंशति मुखः सप्तांग एको न विंशति मुखः स्थूल भुक् वैश्वानर प्रथम पाद स्वस्थान अंत प्रज्ञा सप्तांग एको न विंशति मुखः प्रविविक्त भुक् तैजसो द्वितीय पाद यत्र सुप्तो न कंचन कामं कामयते यत्र सुप्तो न कंचन कामं कामयते न कंचन स्वप्नं पश्यति तत्सुषुप्तं सुषुप्तस्थानं एकीभूतं प्रज्ञानघनं एवानंदमयो ह्यानंद भुक् चेतो मुखः प्राज्ञस्तृतीय पाद एष सर्वेश्वर एष सर्वज्ञाषो अंतर्यामी एष योनिस्सर्वस्य प्रभवाप्ययो हि भूतानां इन द सेवेंथ मंत्र नात प्रज्ञ न बहिष्प्रज्ञ नो भयत प्रज्ञ न प्रज्ञान घन न प्रज्ञ न प्रज्ञ अदृष्टम्यवहार्यम अग्राह्यमलक्षण अचिंत्यम्यपदेश्यम प्रत्ययसारम प्रपंचोपशम शात शिव अद्वैत चतुर्थ मे स आत्मा स विज्ञेय then the eighth mantra soyam atma adhyaksharam omkaram adhimatram pada matra matra ascha pada अकार उकार मकार जागरित स्थानो वैश्वानर अकार प्रथमा मात्रा आप्तेरादिमत्वाप्नोति हवै सर्वान् कामान् आदिश्च भवती यम वेद स्वस्थान तैजस उकारो द्वितीया मात्रा 
उत्कर्षादुभयत्वाद उत्कर्षति हवै ज्ञान संतति समानश्च भवति नास्या ब्रह्मवित कुले भवति यएवं वेद सुषुप्त स्थान प्राज्ञो मकार तृतीय मात्रा मितेरपीतेर्वा मिनोति हवाईदगुम सर्वम अपीतिश्च भवति यएवं वेद the last mantra the 12th one amatra chaturtha avyavaharya prapancho pashama shivo advaita evam omkara atmaiva संविशति आत्मनात्मानं यएवं वेद सो दीज आर द ट्वेल्व मंत्रस विच कॉन्स्टिट्यूट द मांडुक्य उपनिषद द मांडुक्य उपनिषद is of course one of the main upanishads main in what sense they were the upanishads selected by shankaracharya for writing commentaries and so they have become the foundational texts of advaita vedanta among all the upanishads shankaracharya chose by tradition 11 upanishads but 10 are non controversial that clearly shankaracharya wrote commentaries on them the mandukya of all of these upanishads mandukya is the smallest and probably the most powerful there is the nice story which i told you how hanuman asks ramchandra um, how shall i get liberation and ramchandra tells hanuman the mandukya upanishad by itself is sufficient to give liberation to those who seek liberation mandukyam ekam eva alam vimuktanam vimuktai mumukshanam mumukshanam vimuktai mandukya by itself is enough sufficient for those who seek liberation to give liberation to those who seek liberation so it's that powerful the upanishad itself is very small 12 mantras only it's part of the atharva veda and um, the upanishad is traditionally studied with the karikas the karikas are verses composed by gaudapada acharya Govi, uh, Shankaracharya's teacher's teacher. Shankaracharya's teacher was Govinda Pada, and his teacher was Gora Pada. Gora Pada uh, composed these uh, verses as a commentary on the uh, Upanishad, and Shankaracharya wrote a commentary on the Upanishad itself as well as the Karikas. So, so what we are studying in these classes is the original Upanishad plus the Karikas. and what i use is the commentary of shankaracharya on both of them for explanation so it it forms an integral whole actually when starting his commentary on the upanishad shankaracharya he makes this interesting statement he says these four chapters which follow which four chapters the upanishad has only 12 mantras and it's in the first chapter but there are four chapters of the uh, gaudapada karika the mandukya karika so there are four chapters these four chapters which follow con- contain the entire teaching of the of the uh, vedanta in a sense or contains the essence of the teachings of the vedanta so these four chapters are so important the upanishad is important and gaudapada's karikas are important because he said not only is this upanishad important but the four chapters which surround this upanishad are very important they contain the essence sarva sarva vedanta artha uh, sar sangraha bhutam 
Prakarana Chatushtayam idam. These four chapters constitute the essence of the teachings of Vedanta. What are these four chapters? The four chapters are called first the chapter on the Upanishad, Agama Prakarana. The first chapter is called the chapter on the Upanishad because uh, it contains the Upanishad. The Upanishad is embedded in the first chapter. By embedded I mean the Upanishad is there and in between we as we saw there are verses composed by Gaudapada. In fact the first chapter is composed of is constituted of 12 mantras of the Upanishad and 29 verses composed by Gaudapada which are interspersed between the mantras. So the first chapter is called Agama Prakarana, the chapter on the Upanishad. The second chapter which we shall start, the second chapter is called Vaitatya Prakarana. What is that second chapter about? It uses reasoning to prove the claim that the world is an appearance. Jagat Mithyatva. Vedanta, one of the primary claims is the world is not what it seems to be. What we experience it, it's not like that. So, the falsity of the world that is established not on scriptural authority, not on the authority of the Upanishad, but through reasoning. Suppose somebody says, I, I don't believe just because it is said so that the world is supposed to be an appearance. Um, c convince me that the world is an appearance. So, argumentation by reasoning, the second chapter, very interesting chapter. And the name of the second chapter is Vaitatya Prakarana. Vaitatya, it's an interesting Sanskrit word. Tatha means as such. Vitatha means not as it looks like, what, not what it looks like. So, Vaitatya means the chapter which shows that the world is not what it looks like. Vaitatya Prakarana. The third chapter is called Advaita Prakaranam, the chapter on non-duality. The arguments which go to show the falsity of the world in the second chapter, lest those very arguments be used to show the falsity of Brahman also, the ultimate reality. So the third chapter is about proving the existence of Brahman, what is claimed that there is an ultimate reality, what was called Turiya here, the fourth so that is there based on, on argumentation, not on scriptural authority. So the third chapter aims to give a, a conclu a, a persuasive arguments that you are that absolute reality. That there is such an absolute reality and you are that. That's the third chapter. And the fourth chapter is called Alata Shanti Prakaranam. Quenching the firebrand, the chapter on quenching the firebrand. What is quenching the firebrand? I will not go into that. Um, suffice it to say that the fourth chapter is a kind of miscellany. A lot of topics are taken up and dealt with in the fourth chapter. Um, many interesting things are taken up and, and talked about, including different philosophies, other approaches to the same problem and why they are not correct and why this is justifying this approach and refuting other approaches. So that's the fourth chapter. Of these four chapters, we have completed the first one. What did we, what did we learn? Taking a look back. The Upanishad says that the ultimate reality is Brahman. There is an ultimate reality in this universe and that is Brahman. What is that ultimate reality? Where is it? It is you. The Upanishad gives the gives a Mahavakya, one of the profound sentences which sum up the entire teaching of the Upanishads. The most famous Mahavakya is Tattva Masi, that thou art, which Swami Vivekananda popularized here. He spoke about it so many times. That thou art. In this Upanishad, you get another Mahavakya. Same meaning that you are Brahman. What is the Mahavakya here? What is the profound sentence? This very self. I am Atma Brahma. This very self is Brahman. There is an ultimate reality. There is an ultimate reality. But what is that ultimate reality? It's you. You are that ultimate reality. So, to know that ultimate reality, to realize that ultimate reality, Brahman, you have to realize yourself. You have to find out who you really are. We all feel that we know who we are, but... The open Vedanta claims that we do not know correctly. We do not understand the world correctly and we do not understand ourselves correctly. 
if only we would learn to see ourselves correctly, we would realize ourselves as Brahman. And that realization is the goal of life because that takes us beyond sorrow. The whole claim of Vedanta, the whole claim of, uh, of spiritual life, that overcoming and transcendence of sorrow is possible. That is made possible by knowing who you are. Vedanta says the problem is you do not know the ultimate reality about yourself and about Brahman, uh, about yourself and about the world. If you knew the ultimate reality, what is the world and what you are, then you would have no problem at all. You would overcome all suffering. Vivekananda would say in this country, you know, with a great pathos sometimes, if only you knew yourself as you truly are. If only you knew yourselves as you truly are. So knowing ourselves as truly, what we truly are. What are we truly? The Upanishad says, I am Atma Brahma. You are Brahman, that absolute reality. So how do we know ourselves as Brahman? The only way of getting knowledge is inquiry. Anywhere. Anywhere. You need to, if you need knowledge, you need to inquire into it. Whatever the subject, whatever you want to know about it. So in order to know what we are, we have to inquire into ourselves. We have to inquire into the self. So the Upanishad talks about self-inquiry. It does so um, in two types of inquiries. One is an inquiry into the self, Atma. Atma is the word for the self. Atma vichara, self-inquiry, inquiry into the self. Another one is a supporting inquiry, Omkara vichara, an inquiry into the, the mystic, the sacred sound Om. Why? Why does this Om suddenly come into the picture? As a support to this self-inquiry. We shall see that later. So first and most important, this Upanishad and the entire Mandukya Karika is built around inquiry into the self. But then so is all of Vedanta. All Vedanta is basically inquiry into the self. What is the speciality, the unique approach of the Mandukya? The unique approach of the Mandukya Upanishad and the Mandukya Karika is this. The Mandukya Upanishad and Karika takes up the inquiry of the self as the self as a particular technique. It says the self has four aspects. We want to know who we really are. Well, you have four aspects. Upanishad starts with that. Soyam Atma Chatushpad. This, this self, this very self has four aspects. Three of them are well known to you. The fourth one is what we are going to reveal to you. Three of them are what you think you are. And the Upanishad says you are not that. The fourth one is what you really are and you do not know it. What you know about yourself, the first three aspects of yourself, you think that is what you are. That's not who you really are. That's only the surface, let's say. That's a wrong appreciation of what you are. And what you really are, you do not know. That is the fourth one, which the Upanishad will teach. So what are the first three aspects? These are all known. Remember, when you're studying all of them, you know, the, um, fourth mantra, the third mantra and the fourth mantra, um, the waking state, dream state and all of that. Yo, we are learning Mandukya, we are learning Vedanta. It's actually not Vedanta. It's what we all know. What Vedanta is doing is it's just putting a label on what you already know and drawing your attention to it. This is what you think about yourself. And giving a particular picture, a description of what you know already. So what are these first three aspects? The, yes. The first aspect is, it says, the waker and most obvious, what we generally think of ourselves. Of these three aspects, there's the first one itself is what we normally think of ourselves. And the other two we know, but we dismiss it. We don't take it seriously. The first aspect is the waker and the waker's universe. These three aspects are built around the three kinds of experiences which we all have every day. What are they? Waking, dreaming and deep sleep. Waking, dreaming and deep sleep. Somebody said um, that uh, um, these are actually the real rituals that everybody performs throughout one's life. Waking, dreaming and deep sleep. It's not puja or prayer or bowing down. The real ri the rituals that we go through our lives are waking, dreaming and deep sleep. Um, this, uh, actually I was going to, I'm going to give a talk in 
Arizona in the month of um, July in, in Phoenix. And so I said, you set the topic, whatever you want me to speak about. And uh, that, see, that person said the topic, our three daily rituals. I thought, what do you mean? Said, no, don't worry, Swami, that's what you usually always speak about. I'm just giving you this. It's, it's, it just sounds different, but it's what you speak about, so relax. <laughs> so it's true. The waker and the waker's universe, this, right now. See, this is the beauty of Vedanta. It immediately grounds it in your daily experience. Otherwise, it would be some airy speculation, some abstract philosophy that you have to, you know, break your head trying to understand what the professor is talking about. Or some kind of belief system which you, which you are taught in religion. There is some God, some heaven, something. Or some kind of mystical system which yoga teaches. Do these exercises and you will get, get extraordinary experiences. Vedanta is not airy spe speculative metaphysics. Vedanta is not a belief system, not a faith. Vedanta is not um, yogic mysticism. They all have their parts. Um, they, ha they all have their roles to play. There is philosophy in Vedanta. There is, there is a religious side of Vedanta. There is mystic um, yogic practices in Vedanta. No doubt. But at its core, Vedanta is not about that. Look what Vedanta is saying. You experience being awake. What could be more commonplace than that? So you are the waker and here is your waking experience. Remember, we are talking about the self. So the first aspect of the self is that it, it, is, it is the waker. That's the first aspect. It is the waker and it experiences a waking universe. The Upanishad says, through the gateways of the sense organs, we come in contact with the physical world. The word used is thula, gross world, through the senses. And we interact with it. We get information from it and we interact with it. We speak, we walk, we talk, we uh, eat, um, we grasp things and we do things in this world. That is the waker and the waker's world, waker's universe. All this happens in a state called Jagrata, waking state. This is the first aspect of the self. It is the first aspect of yourself, of you. But that's not all. The second aspect is a subtle or sukshma. We fall asleep and we dream. This entire universe, waking universe is erased from our awareness. And I, the waker, I fall asleep and I'm lying on the bed. That is also forgotten. Interesting. It's not the waker who has become in the, who is the dreamer. The waker is forgotten because after all the waker is connected to the waking world. Waker is connected to this body and this body is lying on the bed and sleeping. A dream world is projected. And in the dream world you are there. You are there as a dream person experiencing a dream world. And you know that only after you wake up that it was a dream. So, there is a second state, a second aspect to you called the dream state, where you are the dreamer experiencing the dreamer's world. Second, second aspect of the self. This is called the sukshma or subtle aspect of the self. Why subtle? Because here the sense organs are not contacting a physical universe outside, like this. It's all, all of these, this analysis is from the waking state. Because right now when we are doing Vedanta, we are in the waking state, hopefully. Yeah, that is <laughs> the qualification, <laughs> the requirement. Uh, so, from our point of view, the dream world is a subtle world. It's all in the mind. So, we, but that we experience that. That's another aspect of the self. And the third aspect of the self which we experience is the sleeper, the deep sleeper. Remember, the dreamer is also the sleeper, but the dreamer goes, goes on experiencing a subject and object. You are there in the dream and you have objects which you experience in the dream. The deep sleeper does not experience subjects and objects. The deep sleeper experiences a, a, a resolved state of blankness. I don't say that there is no experience in de deep sleep. Many people, our common idea is deep sleep means no experience. Why? Because 
our no common idea of experience is subject object experience but when the subject object is not there subject object means here i am seeing you the object i the subject i see i hear i touch and so on when this is not there we feel there is no experience but deep sleep is also an experience as i say it is not an absence of experience but an experience of absence deep sleep is an experience of absence so that's another state of the self it's a, a your your own self it's another state of the self again nothing new you should not be um, look look confused you're experiencing it every day we're just describing it deep sleep is an unresolved state of not knowingness but that ex- that's also an experience an experience of not knowingness where the differences of the world are merged into one blankness and you do not know yourself also that as a distinct knower in the waking world you know yourself as a distinct knower there you are you know yourself and this is known in the dream world also you know yourself as a distinct knower knowing a dream world but in deep sleep you do not know yourself as a distinct knower the knower known subject object distinction is erased or covered by ignorance that's deep sleep and again we wake up into the waking world and the dream world and the deep sleep world and this cycles in and out every day that's the story of our days and of our lives so what having described this the upanishad says what you really are is one consciousness which appears as the waker in the waking state and the waker's world which itself appears as the dreamer in the dream state and the dream world which itself appears as the sleeper in the deep sleep state and the resolved merged blankness of the deep sleep world these three states aspects of the self remember self has four aspects the first three aspects are the gross aspect stula the subtle aspect sukshma the causal aspect karana why karana remember there was a particular imagery used that uh, like a cup you know every something is poured into a cup and then poured out of it so it like merging back into something and coming out of it um, a material cause in is that from which products come out or are they they appear in that like a lump of clay a potter fashions that lump of clay into pots so you will feel that the lump of clay is the cause from which the pots have emerged and if the potter is not satisfied with the pots he again dissolves the pots into as long as they are not been uh, burnt already uh, they can again reduce it to a lump of clay so it seems that the pots emerged from the clay and disappeared into the clay the clay is like the source karana the cause from which the effects emerge and disappear so it's like the waking and dreaming are the effects gross effects and subtle effects emerging from the cause which is deep sleep that's the way they are thinking about it come sit yes sit 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 so these are the three aspects of the self the gross the subtle and the causal now the upanishad says all three are appearances of a fourth that fourth the upanishad calls upanishad itself just calls it the fourth gaudapada names it turiya and the name stuck so even now in vedanta turiya is the name for the ultimate reality it literally means the fourth nothing else it just means the fourth so we have swami turiya ananda so literally if you translate it, it it actually means the one who who takes delight in the ultimate reality turiya but if you literally translate it it means the one who takes delight in the fourth <laughs> fourth what you might ask so the reference is to the mandukya karika upanishad remember actually does not use the word fourth so it is that one consciousness which appears in all of these forms note that the individual and the cosmic are all included in this uh, so let me just introduce you to the terms we have already co- used these terms the waker the waking aspect of the self 
is called Vishwa. You, you are called Vishwa as the waker. The same consciousness associated with the entire waking, the gross universe is called Virat, the cosmic consciousness. You, in connection with your dream, the individual dreamer, you are called Taijasa, Sanskrit term for the dreamer. And consciousness connected with the entire subtle universe, all minds together, is called the cosmic mind, Hiranyagarbha. You, in your dream state, you are given a name Pragya. And all, everybody's dream state, causal state of the mind, potential state of the mind, all taken together. Uh, consciousness associated with that cosmic dream, let us say, cosmic deep sleep, let us say, is um, called Ishwara or Antaryami, different names are used. This is just, just some technical names for you. But the Upanishad says that the all of them, the Vekar, Vishwa, the uh, cosmic Vekar, Virat, the individual dreamer, Taijasa, the cosmic mind, Hiranyagarbha, the individual deep sleeper, Pragya, and the cosmic con the consciousness associated with Maya, the, the cosmic state of uh, causality, Ishwara, all of them are appearances and disappearances also in one consciousness called Turiya, the fourth. And that fourth you are. You are that fourth. That's the, that's the real, that, that's what the Upanishad wants to tell us. You think you are the first three. You might think, I never thought I'm, I've got those fancy Sanskrit names, Vishwa and Taijasa and Pragya. No, but you, you know that you are, you are sometimes awake and sometimes you are a dreamer, sometimes you are a deep sleeper. You dream, you sleep, you are awake. That's all it means. Vishwa, Taijasa, Pragya, it means that. So, but we think we are that and the Upanishad says, no, you are that one unchanging consciousness which in the waking state, identified with body and mind, forgetting its known nature as that one unchanging consciousness, thinks of itself as the waker. In the dream state, it thinks of itself as the person in the dream, the dreamer. And deep sleep, it is the deep sleeper. But actually it is one consciousness in which all of these states appear and are experienced and they disappear. That one consciousness is called the fourth Turiyam and that's what you are. Realizing yourself as that is the, realizing means it should become not only understandable, but also a living experience, a living um, a fact, the most important fact of our lives. The whole exercise is to change the reference of the I. When you say I, what does it mean? If you say it means this body and mind, then I am thinking of myself as the Vishwa, the waker. But if it means the consciousness in which this body and mind, this waking person and the waking person's universe appear, that consciousness is I, then that is the Turiyam. So the I should refer to that, first of all, at least in understanding, and then finally as a living realization. So that is the, that is the whole exercise here. That is called enlightenment. When you shift the reference of the I, that's one way of looking at enlightenment. At this point, let me say that there is uh, every possibility of a big, big mistake. I should point it out and that should be kept in mind so that we don't make that mistake. What is the mistake? The mistake is there is a waking state, aspect one of the self. There is a dream state, aspect two of the self. There is a deep sleep state, aspect three of the self. And now you are talking about something called the fourth, Turiyam. So the, is there a fourth Turiya state, fourth state, something else? No, it is not that four aspects are all mutually exclusive. There is a fourth aspect uh, called Turiya which we have to find out. No, what the Upanishad actually wants to say is there is only one aspect of this. There is only one uh, self, one pure consciousness which appears in three aspects. The fourth one is not another aspect, aspect of the self. It is the one reality. Actually, the truth is there is only one. It looks like three. Point, from the point of view of the three, that one reality has to be seen as the fourth one. That's why it's called the fourth. So, 
the problem with with this mistake is that when you when you make this mistake you you then think consequences are bad the consequence will be oh there are there is something called the fourth aspect of the self so a fourth state just as i am the waker in the waking state i am the dreamer in the dream state i am the deep sleeper in the deep sleep state i will be the turiya in the turiya state so where is the waker available in the waking state not in the dreamer where is the waker available in the waking state not in deep sleep similarly we will think where is the turiya available in turiya state remember this is wrong this is not correct many people think that don't learn this that i were taught that this is absolutely just just completely wrong but it's a natural mistake to make and many people make it and it's not their fault it's the teacher should point it out it's not a fourth state sometimes the some of the texts later advaitic texts make it worse by speaking of it as a fourth state turiya avastha they are well meaning but they compound the error they, they make it uh, worse uh, let's make it clear that turiya is not something available in the in some state called the turiya avastha rather where is the turiya available here and now wherever there is the waker the turiya is available wherever there is the dreamer turiya is available wherever there is the deep sleeper turiya is available because turiya is you yourself it is the reality which appears as the three so turiya is available here otherwise you know what will happen is okay we are studying vedanta here but this is not the real thing we have to go to another state in the waking state we have to come to the class in vedanta society and attend the class and then get information and then go into another state i don't know how you will go into that state some samadhi some kind of uh, drugs or something like that and then attain to here now people get this mistake sometimes they think it's by drugs you can do that not so much here in california they they think that huh magic mushroom yes and and in uh, uh, in the himalayas also i have actually heard us um, there is a subcult among the monks they they smoke that uh, ganja what is hemp hemp yes and so i remember one monk told me that he was talking good sense until that moment he he <laughs> said he said at that very edge he was in hindi at that very edge o swami one puff one puff it will take you over the edge <laughs> into the turiya I I said ah the mistake <laughs> somehow you have to get out of the waking state into some kind of mystical state you know if you take that example i've often given ornaments and gold the thing becomes very clear there is a um, um, bracelet made of gold a necklace made of gold um, a ring made of gold somebody comes and tells you that these ornaments these are three ornaments but this is not the reality the reality is something called gold the reality is a fourth called gold now if you think that gold is a fourth kind of ornament first ornament is a bracelet second ornament is a necklace and third ornament is a ring in fact the example becomes even better the way they tell it the teachers they say that the same gold it is made by the jeweler into a bracelet then it is melted and made same gold that the bracelet is gone it is melted in and made into a necklace again it is melted and made into a ring necklace is gone bracelet is gone like our three states waking dreaming and and deep sleep do not exist parallelly they exist in succession the waking fades away into the dream the dream fades away into deep sleep the deep sleep fades away and waking comes again it's like the same thing what is the thing like the gold which is being coined fashioned designed into waking into dreaming into deep sleep let's put it that way if somebody thinks that gold is now a fourth kind of ornament let me search for gold let me throw away these three ornaments and look for gold you'll never find it that's one mistake that there is a fourth kind of ornament which i have to look for never find it the other mistake is thinking that <coughs> The, the mistake of the ignorant person thinking that the reality is the ornament so thinking that the bracelet itself is the reality what will happen to this person the moment the bracelet is melted you think i'm gone i'm dead i'm finished 
So what you have to realize is, it is the same thing which appeared as the bracelet, as the necklace, as the ring. Uh, doesn't matter, the name changed. Bracelet, ring, necklace. The form changed. One is like this and the use, you put it here. One is like this and you put it here. One is little like this, you put it here. Name, form and use. Nama, Rupa, Vyabhara keeps changing. But it is the one reality. So that one reality is this consciousness, Turiyam, that you are. What is the one consciousness which is common to all these three kinds of experiences we have? That's the great mistake and don't make that mistake. That's the fourth Turiyam which we are. The seventh mantra is the most important mantra of the Upanishad. Uh, let me quickly chant it and see what it says. What is this Turiyam? Now if you are in, interested in inquiring, what is this Turiyam? It says, Nantaf Pragyam, it's not the dreamer. Nabahish Pragyam, it's not the waker. Naubhayataf Pragyam, nothing in between also. Because people ask this question, that uh, you're talking about only three states. Waking, dreaming and deep sleep. But there are other kinds of states. Somebody is in a coma, somebody is in hibernation maybe, if you are a bear. Or somebody is in a, a mystic state, some kind of mystical state, samadhi. Somebody is under the influence of drugs. So these are different kinds of states which are neither waking, nor dreaming, nor deep sleep. Now bhayata pragyam, nothing in between, none of them also. Na pragyana ghanan, not the deep sleeper. Na pragyam. It's, we are not talking about some religious idea of God who knows everything. So, Turiya is not the uh, mind of God which knows the entire universe. To put it in our gold and jewels example, Turiya does not mean, that gold is not the set of three, three uh, uh, ornaments. All ornaments taken together is not the gold. Gold is the substance out of which those ornaments are made. Even if none of those ornaments were there, even if it, it gold can still exist as, as a lump. So it's not omniscience of God which we are talking about here. Then is it insentience? Nothing is there? No consciousness at all? That's what, that's what the fourth is? No, no apragyam. It's not insentience either. It's not unconsciousness either. Then it goes on. Adrishtam abhyavaharyam agrahyam alakshanam achintyam abhyapadeshyam. In this um, series of terms, barrage of terms, what it has done is, it says it is not an object of the senses. You can't see it, hear it, smell it, touch it, taste it. It's not an object of speech. You can't speak about it. Words, you can't name it. No words will denote it. No words can refer to it. You can't use your s motor organs. You can't walk to the Turiya. You can't grasp the Turiya. I remember... So when novices come to become monks, so we are rightly so, we are very enthusiastic, but immediately we are going to become enlightened. I thought so too. That uh, it's a matter of days only when I become <laughs> the next Buddha in the making. So, and days stretch into months and years and decades. So it's not all that easy. And we know it's not easy, but it's, you can forgive youthful enthusiasm. So one of these uh, novices, he was a bit strange. Um, and... So he, you, and you, ex, you expect to get strange people in monastic life. <laughs> There's one senior Swami said, unless you're slightly mad, you, you're not going to be a monk. So, but there's a difference between slightly mad and really strange. <laughs> now, he was very intense, extraordinarily intense. And the Swami in charge was a very wise old monk. He said, the look he has in his eyes, as if he's, we're standing in front of the wash basin, you know. As if he's going to pounce and catch hold of Brahman like this. You know, he caught hold of the, the, the tap and gave it a good shaking. You can't catch hold of uh, Brahman with your hands. You can't walk to Turiyam. You can't catch hold of Turiyam. Um, and so on. The sense organs, the motor organs cannot make it their object. The sense organs cannot make it their object. Speech cannot make Turiya the object. Um, you might object here that you are using words. Brahman, Atman, Turiya, so many words you are using. So why, ca why are you saying that speech cannot express it? I hope you know what I am talking about. There is a whole lecture on it. Uh, the paradox of language. And, uh, all that. Why? 
uh, speech cannot express. It's right here in Shankaracharya's commentary on this particular mantra. Shankaracharya devotes a long commentary, philosophy of language, what language can do and hence what it cannot do. And then when you look at what Turiya is supposed to be, you see it is beyond the range of language. I'm reminded of Wittgenstein who said, the limits of language are the limits of the universe. You say, so beyond the universe there's nothing. No, Wittgenstein does not say that there's nothing beyond the universe. It's like saying, beyond the set of jewels, there's nothing. No. The set of jewels can be infinitely mutable and changeable. But there is something underneath all of them. Wittgenstein also said, he, he had one classic book. This, um, it's called Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus. He wrote it in prison camp in the First World War. Imagine, it's a classic of 20th century philosophy. A small book. So one of the first things he said was the limits of language are the limits of the universe. And they are all written in cryptic little sentences like this. Make of it what you will. And his introduction is also very nice. He says, what I'm going to write in those pages will only make sense to those who have already understood what I'm going to say. <laughs> and then he adds, you might say, well, what a nice fellow. But then he adds, goes on further to add that as for the rest, I don't care. <laughs> So the limits of the universe and the limits of language are, one, are the same. And then he concludes the book at the very end by saying, what is beyond language and what is beyond the universe? He said, there is something. We must pass over that in silence. And you'll see the seventh mantra refers to the Turiyam as silence. Later on we'll see in the Om analysis, Silence is used to refer to the Turiyam. It does not mean it does not exist. As Wittgenstein himself intuited, there is something. Anyway, now, the, it is not an object of language. It is not an object of thought. You cannot infer it. Achintyam. You cannot name it. You cannot infer it. By saying these things, you know what they have done, what the Upanishad has done. The first third of this mantra, it denied that it's the waker, dreamer, deep sleeper. And this part of the second third of the mantra has denied that it is, the Turiyam is the waker's universe, dreamer's universe and deep sleeper's merged universe. You see, object of the senses, no. Object of sense organs, of motor organs, no. Object of thought? No. Object of speech? No. So it has denied that it's the universe also. It's not the knower of the universe. It's not something that is known in the universe. So in negative senses, neti neti. Now the last third, third of this mantra shows you positively or at least indicates positively what it might be. A very crucial phrase. Ekatma pratyasaram. It is indicated by the continuous cognition of I, I, I. Not this I, the vertical I. I, referring to yourself. All the time we have the feeling I. I am the waker, I am the dreamer, I am the deep sleeper, I am the body, I am the mind, I am a man, I am a woman, I am an Indian, I am a Chinese, I am uh, American. But that I, the continuous sense of self, that is the thing to catch hold of. If you follow that to its source, you will find Turiyam. That's the indication which is given. If, basically, that's what we are doing, an investigation into the I, the self. Prapancha upashamam. It is the silence of the universe. It is the quiescence. The word used is quiescence of the universe. The universe is not there. It's like saying, gold in itself is the silence of the ornaments. Gold is no ornament in itself. Go, when you say gold, it does not refer to any particular ornament. It is the reality, but it's not an ornament as such. So similarly, whether you are waking, dreaming or in deep sleep or in samadhi or whatever state, live or dead, in all circumstances, you are that Turiyam, that pure consciousness, which is 
which is prapanchopashamam, which is where the universe is not there. Neither the waker's universe, nor the dreamer's universe, nor the deep sleep causal universe. Prapanchopashamam. And thus this Turiyam transcends God. What is God? God is Ishwara, that's term used Ishwara. It is the causal state. Like you in your deep sleep, you can see yourself as the causal state of yourself. From that deep sleep state, you come up as the waker and the dreamer. Similarly, imagine the entire universe in a causal state. The, the, the symbology is Vishnu sleeping in his, uh, you know that thousand headed, hooded serpent, Sheshanaga. But that the symbology is that, that the entire universe is merged, no differentiation, and consciousness alone remains with that merged universe. So, but this Turiyam is beyond that. It's not the causal state also. It is beyond cause and effect. Karya, Karana, Vilakshana. Beyond cause and effect. Prapanchopashamam, the cessation of the universe. And when is it the cessation of the universe? At all times. Even when the universe is appearing. This is where you get the clue that Advaita holds that the universe is an appearance. It's not real. The rope is the cessation of the false snake. The desert is the cessation of the mirage water. When? Even when the mirage water is appearing, there is no mirage water there. Even when the snake is appearing, there is no snake there. It's a rope. Even when the universe is appearing, there is no universe in Turiya. It is Turiya alone. Prapanchopashamam. Shantam. Peace itself. It's your name, Turiyam. Peace itself. Here peace means complete transcendence of sorrow. There is no trouble, no sorrow there. You might say in deep sleep also no sorrow, no trouble. But in deep sleep the seed of sorrow is there. Because you are going to wake up. So, but in Turiya there is no sorrow. It is beyond sorrow. Shantam means Dukkha Nivritti, beyond sorrow. Shivam, Shivam here means auspicious. Auspicious, Ananda Swarupam, it is bliss itself. Advaitam, it is non-dual. There is no second thing apart from Turiyam. You as the waker, you are in a world of Dvaita. You are there and everybody else is there and all these things are there. In dreams also, in your dream world, there are so many things. Though they are all projections of one mind, but everything is, uh, you see it as separate. And in deep sleep, though you have a non-duality, there is no duality experience there, but the seed of duality is there. Because it's going to become a dual universe very soon when you wake up. But Turiya itself is non-dual. All this duality is superimposed. It's an appearance. It's not real. Dream example is very good. In the dream, you see duality. You see so many things. So many people, so many places, so many events and happenings, good and bad. But when you wake up, you realize it was a dream. It was all my mind. All of it. All the people in the dream were my mind. All the places in my dream were my mind. All the things which happened, good and bad, were my mind. They were not a second reality apart from my mind. Do you agree with me? In the dream. That means, as far as the dream is concerned, your mind is non-dual with respect to the universe of the dream. Your mind is non-dual, not two. Other than your mind, nothing in your dream is a separate reality. It looks separate. It looks like thousands of people and lots of events and lots of places. But it's all your mind only. It has no existence apart from your mind. Dream. Exactly in the same way what it is saying is, this experience which you are having is not a second reality apart from Turiya, the fourth, the consciousness itself. Advaitam. So what? Good for Turiya. What is it to me? Sa Atma. That's you. That's you. It's nice to know, but even knowing all of this doesn't seem to make a difference. Savigyaha, it has to be realized. Not just known, it has to become a living fact. Alright. Now what, where do we go from here? This studium, to understand this, 
the, the analysis of Om is introduced. So far, remember, go back to the original thing. This very self is Brahman. You are Brahman. So if you realize the truth about yourself, you'll realize the truth about the universe, about the ultimate reality. How do you realize the truth about yourself? It introduced inquiry into the self. Four aspects of the self. Now it is complete. The inquiry is complete. Uh, waker, dreamer, deep sleeper, they are all appearances of a fourth one called Turiyam. Now, a second kind of inquiry is introduced as a support. Take the holy sound Om. It is something that is revered in all the Indian traditions. All traditions of Hinduism, from the very most ancient of the Vedas till today, in every kind of branch of Hinduism, whenever Sanskrit mantras are used, even in vernacular sometimes mantras are used, Om is added. And um, in Buddhist traditions, Om is regarded as very holy. In Jain and in Sikh traditions, in Sikhism, the ultimate reality is called Ik Omkar, one Om. So, what is the meaning of, what is this Om inquiry? The real deep meaning of Om. Many meanings of Om are available. If you inquire, Om means Brahma, Vishnu, Maheshwara, three aspects of God. Um, om means uh, the higher worlds and this world and the lower worlds and so on. Om means many things. But the real, the deepest meaning of Om, the actual meaning of Om is this, what you find in the Mandukya Upanishad. It actually, to put it straight for, uh, straight away, Om means you. It's your name actually, ultimately. So, the real you. Now, what is the Om analysis? Om has four letters. What are the four letters of Om? A, U, M. In English, the closest ones are A, U and M. These are the three and following that the silence that is taken as the fourth. So actually three letters but actually the, the silence after the third one is taken as the fourth. So four letters. Immediately you think hmm the self has four aspects and the Om has four, four letters. Can we map them? And the Upanishad says yes you should map them. How do you map them? The first letter of Om, A or A, A is the name of you the waker. You the waker and your waking world. This is called, just what do you mean it's the name? Just associate it in your mind. This experience is a. Uh, give it a name in your mind, associate it, name it. As it fades away into dream, the dreamer and the dream world, name it. Don't wait for the dream to come. Right now in the class, when you're studying Vedanta, mentally name, think of your dream experience and name it U. As it fades away into deep sleep, that blankness of deep sleep, the darkness of deep sleep, which we all experience, name it M, the M. And the one consciousness, the fourth aspect of the self, which, you realize, which we discussed, Neither the waker, nor the dreamer, nor the deep sleeper, not something in between, not the consciousness of God, not unconsciousness. See, I'm translating the Sanskrit. That which, which cannot be an object of the senses, object of the motor organs, cannot be an object of speech, cannot be an object of the mind, uh, which is indicated by the continuous I, I, I cognition, which is the silence of the universe, which is uh, uh, peace itself, which is uh, bliss itself, which is uh, non-dual. That one consciousness, Turiyam, associate the silence at the end of Om with, with the Turiyam. So, A, U, M, A, U, M and silence stand respectively for waker and waker's world, dreamer and dream world, deep sleeper and de deep sleep darkness and the one consciousness which appears in all of these forms. So, the silence stands for that one consciousness, Turiyam. Now as you chant Om in a low voice or mentally, cycle through it. You don't have to fall asleep, you don't have to dream. Just sit like a meditation, it is a meditation exercise, it's Om is a meditation exercise, which helps you to assimilate the entire teaching of the Upanishad. So when you chant, go through Om, cycle through the, your waking experience, dream experience, simulate it in your mind. You are in the waking world, sitting and meditating. 
now you have fallen asleep and you are dreaming and now everything has stopped deep sleep all of this is appearing in one consciousness as you go through that uh, ooh, mm. don't chant aum a uh, and u together in uh, sanskrit becomes o so om is the correct pronunciation not aum not a u m but a and u becomes o so o is the correct pronunciation om as you chant om mentally cycle through the three experiences you have and see that it is appearing to one consciousness that one consciousness is never an object it's not a person it's not a thing it's not a knower and known it's not the constituent of a stage a state like waking dreaming or deep sleep rather it is the material or it is the reality which alone appears in all of these forms and it's always available and that's what you are all troubles and problems belong to waking dreaming and deep sleep waking and dreaming waking what you call real problems of my life dreaming dream problems nightmares deep sleep potential problems waking up <laughs> none of them apply to thuriam the consciousness beyond all problems are in a u m but none of the pro- usually silence is golden no problems so there is no problem in the silence beyond that just remember just as thuriam is the underlying consciousness of waking dreaming deep sleep not something apart from them this silence is also not the physical silence at the end of om you chant om and then silence not just that it is the silence which underlies sound and silence which underlies absence of sound a physical silence is the absence of sound but om the silence at the end of om is not just the absence of sound it is there when the sound is there it is there when the sound is not there it is the witness consciousness of silence when you are absolutely silent consciousness is the witness of that silence it is that witness consciousness which continues when there is sound also so the silence at the end of om is we are talking about consciousness silence which is underlying sound and the absence of sound this concludes the om thing. now i just add one thing and stop how does this om thing work at all there is a deeper understanding involved here i have already explained that once but i should tell you again it's like this things have names words designate things so clock designates this this is the thing and clock is the word clock thing book is the word the name and this is the thing so names or words express things they refer to things so when you use a word like necklace and a word like gold what happens is you know the necklace refers to that thing the necklace but when you introduce a word like gold a problem arises now you have two words necklace and gold but you don't have two things you have only one thing which is the word for it you might say both not really because of the classic thing is that if i take the gold away if i say both I'll, all right let me take the gold away you keep the necklace you cannot the value is the value of the gold not the value of the necklace you should object here said no oh, swami if you go to tiffany's or some kind of nice jewelry shop the brand has the value not just the gold itself true but let me ask you if you take the gold away how much value the brand, does the brand have nothing so the um, necklace is a word without any object because the object is referred to by the word gold the moment you introduce the word gold gold refers to the whole object the entirety of the reality there <coughs> necklace is left as a word without an object so necklace is a word there is no object per, uh, per uh, uh, corresponding to it so the the object which you we called a necklace is an appearance in gold is a name and a form and a use in gold right 
because there is, the, there is no substantial object corresponding to the word necklace, the word necklace disappears into silence. Exactly like that, the sounds a, uh, ooh, and m mm, refer to what? Not some jewelry. A uh, refers to the entire physical universe. U uh, refers to the entire subtle universe. All our minds and intellects and memories combined together. M mm, refers to our entire causal universe, the deep sleep state. All of us, all together. They all fall to silence when you bring in the, you know, the Turiya, the pure consciousness, which alone appears as the waking, just like gold appears as the necklace. That which alone appears as the dream universe, just like gold appears as the bracelet. Which alone appears as the deep sleep darkness, just as gold appears as the ring. If you bring in Turiya, then waking universe, dream universe, deep sleep universe are words without any object to correspond to. Because the object is the Turiya. The reality is the Turiya. So they fall into silence. A, U, M falls into the silence at the end of Om. And that silence corresponds exactly to the Turiya. The words become appearances and the names become silent. The silence refers to the Turiya. So that is basically, uh, I have not summarized the contents of the Karikas. I have just summarized the content of the the whole structure of the Upanishad. So that's the Mandukya Upanishad, associated karikas also of Gaudapada. That's the theme, the very grand theme of the, of the first chapter. Uh, it, uh, it's good to remember the story. I often told the story of, of King Janaka, na ye such, na wo such. Neither this is true nor that is true, who dreamt that he was defeated by an enemy and then uh, he wanted to ask, like the Chinese philosopher, I think Chuan Tzu, who said that, am I a man dreaming that, uh, that I was a butterfly or am I a butterfly who was dreaming that I am a man? Uh, which one is true? And the answer was, so in, in, in that philosophy it's just left like that. But in Advaita the answer is given. The answer is that neither the man nor the butterfly is true. Neither the, the waking nor the dreaming is true. What is true is the one which experiences them. Why are they not true? Because they come and go. Sometimes that lump, that, that, that thing is a necklace, sometimes it's a, a ring, sometimes it's a bracelet. So they are, those things are not true in themselves. There is some underlying truth which is appearing in these forms. That underlying truth is gold. Here that underlying truth is consciousness. That one which saw the dreams, that is the same one which is seeing the waking. The waking is no more true than the dreams. And we'll have let um, uh, the Sri Ramakrishna and the Holy Mother have the last words. Sri Ramakrishna used to give the example of a farmer, poor farmer, who dreamt that he was a king and with seven princes, his children, he had seven children who were seven sons who were fine princes. And suddenly he was woken up when he was dreaming and he was very irritated. What, what's the matter? Oh, your son. He had only one son in, in the waking world. He is ill. He said, what have you done? You ruined my dream where there were seven fine sons and you, I lost seven for the sake of one. <laughs> uh, then they said, well, are you crazy? This is real. This is, this is your waking world. This is your real family. This is your son. And that's what, that was your dream. He said, for me, both are the same. It might sound like a very silly story, but from Advaita point of view, it makes a great deal of sense. From the point of view of pure consciousness, it is one reality. Holy Mother is even more direct. Talking with a monk once in Jairambati, she said, this world, my son, is a dream. That monk, project, uh, he objected. He said, how can it be a dream? He gives one, exa one argument, many arguments are possible against this, uh, this uh, claim that this, this is also a dream. He said, how can this be a dream? This lasts. Every dream is different. But when you wake up, this world is there. Uh, it lasts, it's stable. So how can it be a dream? And she did not give any Advaitic argument or a lecture, uh, did not take out the Upanishads. She laughed. She laughed and she said, be it so, my child, it is nothing more than a dream. Tahok. Ta, uh, ta Holeva in Bengali he said, Ta Holeva, 
স্বপ্ন বই তো নয় বাবা লেট ইট বি মাই লেট দ্যাট বি সো লেট ইট বি মোর লাস্টিং এন্ড লেট দ্যাট বি লেস লাস্টিং বাট বোথ আর ড্রিমস দে অ্যাপিয়ার সো লাইক জনক দ্য এম্পর ওয়াজ শকড দিস ইজ অলসো আ ড্রিম দ্যাটস অলসো আ ড্রিম সো ইজ নাথিং ইজ ট্রু নো 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 সামথিং গ্রেট ইজ ট্রু হোয়াট ইজ দ্যাট গ্রেট থিং উইচ ইজ ট্রু ইউ ইউ আর দ্য ট্রুথ দ্যাট ট্রুথ ইজ দ্য ফোর্থ সুরিয়ম এক্সিস্টেন্স কনসিয়াসনেস প্লেস ওকে I think I'm done. Uh, if you have any questions, we still have a little bit of time. Yes. You mentioned that uh, the thinking of the fourth state or the fourth uh, aspect as another state is a mistake. But, you, uh, if, you know, for people who experience samadhi, yes. yeah, can you explain that? Because, you know, when Thakur comes, you know, he comes back from samadhi and he says that he cannot be expressed, you know, what... True, true. And uh, he just, you know, he says that first you say, oh, and then, you know, later on he starts talking. So, hmm. so can you explain the interpretation of that in this context? Yeah, samadhi is, uh, these are mystical states which cannot be denied. Advaita does not deny these samadhis. <laughs> that there are high states, mystical states which can be experienced and they are very valuable. They are extremely powerful in giving you spiritual enlightenment. But remember... What you experience in Samadhi is also available now. Hmm. A good example is this. Um, a man took his son, a little kid, to a movie and uh, explained that the movie plays on a screen. There are pictures and sound on a screen, that's a movie. So when they are in the movie hall, it's dark and the movie has started. So the child gets engrossed in the movie. That's what happens to us. We are born, movie has started already. Mom and dad are there and then we have to grow up and go to school and, and so on. The, so we get engrossed in the movie. After some time, the kid remembers that his dad told him that there's something called a screen. So he says, what is the screen there, dad? And his father says, it's right there in front of you. That's the screen. And the boy says, oh, maybe he's watching Star Wars. He says, oh, Luke Skywalker is the screen. No, 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 behind, behind him. Behind him. Behind him, maybe, who's there? Darth Vader. Darth Vader is the screen. Uh, I'll share something with you. that uh, I had actually watched the first Star Wars movie when I was a kid. Um, it, it was 1970s at that time my parents took me. And I'll never forget it. Because my little kid brother, who was a baby in arms at that time, well, he was also, my mom took him to the movie also with us. And a big mistake. <laughs> Because when, once when one of those space battles started and Chewbacca started howling and everything, he burst into tear, tears and started cry, crying loudly. And all the people around in the hall, you know, they all went shh and gave us dirty looks and we had to walk out. And I never forgave him for that. <laughs> I was so furious with him. So that's the screen. Behind Luke Skywalker is, uh, what is that? Um, Darth Vader is the screen. No, 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 behind that also. Behind them, oh, space. The d- stars and planets and all, that's the screen. No, no, no. All of that is the screen. Oh, so? Um, the Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader and spaceships and space and stars and planets, all of that put together is the screen? No, no, not put together. You remove all of that and that's the screen. Oh, remove all of that. That means the screen is nothing. How will the father point out the screen to the son? Because whatever he points to, there is a picture. And the son will take the picture as the screen. That's exactly what is happening to us. It's analogous to the problem when you try to point out gold to somebody who does not know. You say, point to the necklace and say, that's gold. Ring and that's gold. And the bracelet and that's gold. And the person thinks... And, um, necklace is what you mean, a ring is what you mean, bracelet is what you mean. Does not understand the underlying reality that is called. Exactly the same thing happens. Now, how do, how do you make that person realize what is the screen? One way, I'm coming to your question, I've not forgotten. One way is you can switch off the movie. If you just switch off the movie and the hall is dark, that's deep sleep. You don't see the movie, you don't see the screen either. But when the lights come on in the hall and then you can see the empty screen, that's an analogy. It's not a perfect analogy for samadhi. Nirvikalpa samadhi is something like that. 
Something like that. It's not exactly like that. In the Patanjali Yoga Sutra, it is said that vritti sarupyam, like vrittis are movements of the mind, like pictures on a screen, movements on the mind, we take it to be us. Anger, I am angry. Swami Sarva Priyananda, I am Swami Sarva Priyananda. Desires, intentions, projects, frustrations, anger, hatred, despair, sleepiness, all of that. I am angry, I am in despair, I am depressed, I am sleepy, I am... All of those are movements of the mind and we take it as I myself. That there is a reality beyond the mind. Like a screen, the mind is like a movie playing on a screen. We miss the screen. Now what is the obvious solution? Can you switch off the mind? Yes, it can be done. We don't think it can be done, but it actually can be done. And that's the purpose of meditation. Patan- Patanjali Yoga Meditation. Chitta Vritti Nirodha. Cessation of movements of the mind. Calming the waves in the lake of the mind. That is Samadhi. What will happen? What will happen? Tada Drashtu Swarupe Avasthanam. Then the one consciousness beyond the mind is appreciated in its real nature. That's the way of Samadhi. But you will notice one thing. He does not mention it here. There is another way of showing the kid the screen. Tell me, when you switch up the movie and put on the lights, the screen is there. When you have the uh, movie playing, when the movie is going on, is the screen there or not? Is the screen there or not? Yes. yes. Obviously. What is the proof? The movie is playing. If you take off the screen, the movie has nothing to play upon. The playing of the movie itself is the direct proof that there must be a screen for the movie to play on. If you switch off the lights, switch off the movie, complete darkness, the screen is still there, but it's not appreciated. It's not caught. Now, when the movie is playing, Can you educate the child, showing the child the mechanics of the movie and the screen, so that while the movie is playing, the child will get an understanding of what's going on. And while the movie is playing, in the understanding of the child, will learn to distinguish between screen and picture. Can you do that? That can be done. That's the way of Vedanta. This is the difference between Samadhi and uh, and Jnana. Sri Ramakrishna had an interesting comment here. He said, Samadhi na hole thik thik na. Unless you get this Samadhi experience, it is not rightly done. It not rightly done means, uh, it might not be very firm. It's one thing to understand the, the physics and the, uh, the electronics behind a movie and the optics behind a movie. And another thing to switch off the movie and look at the blank screen for yourself. So, uh, Samadhi is a powerful aid. You know what Vedanta would say? It's an aid for mediocre students. <laughs> for the best kind of students like you, the knowledge itself is sufficient. It should lead to enlightenment. <laughs> so, that's the role of Samadhi. But yes, practically if you say, what about come down to brass tacks? If you look at the lives of practitioners, whether Vedantic practitioners or yogis, they all try to attain Samadhi, definitely. Once you realize that I am that pure consciousness, you would like to remain absorbed in that. If you can, you have attained Samadhi. If you cannot, the mind is still playing its waking, dreaming, deep sleep. Then you are still that pure consciousness, but it is not Samadhi. Samadhi is very powerful. One more point, I will not explain it, there is no time. You do not get enlightenment in Samadhi. You get enlightenment through knowledge before Samadhi and then the mind can become absorbed in Samadhi. One. Or you can take the yogic path, practice Samadhi until you get Samadhi and come out of Samadhi, you will get enlightenment. It requires the mind to work to come to this conclusion. I am Turiya. This thought itself is in the mind. If the mind is shut down, you can't have this thought. But you can get this thought after the mind starts working. Oh, what was that just now? I was there. Even without the world, even without the body, even without me, the mind. I was there. 
So I am not the body mind, I am that one shining light. Yes, I'll come to you. No, but in Sri Ramakrishna's uh, situation, he just spontaneously, like while talking or while act, went into Samadhi. Hmm. So it would look to, like almost that his mind preferred to be in that state or that's hmm. the natural state. Yes, him. but ima- that was Sri Ramakrishna and also remember how much of an enormous effort, superhuman effort he put into it before he came to that thing huh? and we don't see that in uh, any any in the case of other sadhakas very rare very very rare that kind of mind even you take a common example our day to day examples of concentration mihai chigzen mihai who wrote the book flow on uh, concentration on attention he says that he devised the word flow what happens when you have intense concentration and expertise somebody playing a game of baseball or basketball uh, or somebody, a chess, or somebody playing a musical instrument who is very good at it, a maestro. So they seem to have an e- extraordinary performance and yet it seems to be effortless. Uh, in transcending time, hours may pass and that person will not feel it. So when he was talking to a conductor of, a, uh, of an orchestra, Mihai Chigzen Mihai, studying the phenomenon of attention and concentration, that um, maestro, he used the word, the music just flows. That's where he got the word flow and he named the book flow on attention, book on attention. So the, he waves the hands and the music just flows. And then Mihai Chikzin Mihai comments there. He has put in 30 years of rigorous training. If I wave my hands, nothing will flow. <laughs> yes. So, Sri Ramakrishna, that is the state of the mind. But he is the Turiya which you are and which I am right now. He is not some superior grade of Turiya and we are a lower grade of Turiya. No, we are exactly the same thing. Yes, so, I'll come to you. So, as I understand, Samadhi is, is like a perfectly still mind. Still mind. What is that experience like? Is, is that <laughs> I mean, is, is that like complete darkness and blankness? No, it's like... Uh, one Swami described it very nicely. For me, I think that that, that a description works. It's like being in deep sleep and yet fully awake. So that's darkness, right? Yeah, complete. complete darkness of the universe. There's no world, there's no thought, no mind, no I, no ego, and yet you're fully awake. You're fully aware. In deep sleep, that awareness is not there. In deep sleep, it was just defined here, knows neither the world nor oneself. That is deep sleep. That's the description of deep sleep. But in Samadhi, you are there, fully aware, but there is nothing to know. One Swami wrote a poem about it in in Malayalam. And uh, I cannot read Malayali, so I don't know the poem. But the translation, the, the title of the poem is so evocative. Just that title shows that it's, it's an enlightened Swami. The title is The Midnight Sun. You are the midnight sun. It's midnight, absolutely dark. The world is covered in darkness. And yet you are the sun blazing forth with tremendous light. So That's a way of indicating what Nirvikalpa Samadhi might be like. But there are other Samadhis where the world is blanked out, but you have the vision of a deity. That's Savikalpa Samadhi. So Sri Ramakrishna saw Kali often, Bhav Samadhi. Where it is not completely blanked out the world, but the presence of God becomes very dominant there. So, mind is focused on that. You can sort of vaguely see the world, but experiences God very vividly. Those are uh, in the bhakti traditions. Yes. It's appealing, you present with a lot of logic around it, and, and that the others can easily be denied, and this is the one constant. For those who actually truly realize it, hmm. what is that experience? Right. I mean, so Samadhi is one experience we're talking about. Yeah. What is the, the real experience, the real knowledge? Like the, the real knowledge. knowledge. The real knowledge, that thing, enlightenment, is a shift. I will say in practical terms, I'll tell you a few things. One is, it's a permanent shift in what you consider yourself to be. 
first of all that underlying consciousness just like if I say the underlying reality of the railing here the lectern here and that altar here is wood and I tell you see wood here there you would say yeah it's easy enough you don't see anything different you just shifted your paradigm you're thinking of it as a lectern a railing and, a, and an altar now you say okay I see it as wood basically you're seeing the same thing but your paradigm shifted when I tell you to look at the ornament as gold look at the wave as water okay you will say oh, yeah I understand because you know what is wave and water you know what is lectern and wood exactly like that this person knows what is pure consciousness of Turiya, existence consciousness bliss and how it appears as this universe and all the time uh, this is ever available to that person so one characteristic is that permanently there is a change in what he or she thinks of the, the self what am I I am Turiyam that will be there <coughs> second characteristic practically it will never go away it's not an understanding right now you're saying it's beginning to seem logical you presented a good case for it another lawyer another advocate could have presented another case for it better or worse case for it but these are persuasions you say I am persuaded being persuaded and convinced are not the same thing that person is convinced beyond the slightest shred of doubt you cannot shake that person no, no more than you can say a person who is looking at the light there and say there is no light I'm seeing it. <coughs> it's like saying, saying that there's no wood here. So I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. I'm touching it. In fact, you will say there's nothing but wood here. You'll go, go to the other way. Uh, the person who's realized the Turiya will say there's nothing but Turiya here. We say the world and no Turiya. He sees Turiya and no world also. And another thing is never not there. The another way of describing it is effortless. It is effortlessly available to that person. It does not take, okay, Turiya, wait, I had got it all clear in my mind, just have to look at my notes once more. <laughs> or, a little confused, I have to sit in Samadhi a little bit meditation, then it will be clear. No. Do you need a little bit of meditation to make this into wood? No. No. You know it is. It will be, another example is, your name. Somebody asks you your name. You don't have to make an effort. You don't have to refer to notes. You don't have to meditate upon it. It's spontaneous. It's an example. It will be like that. These are different ways I'm telling you. So will you realize, so experience, uh, will, will see everything as non-dual? Like will understand everything, will know everything as non-dual. Huh. It's like asking you. Uh, asking, as, asking you, are you seeing uh, a lectern or a wood or wood here? What are you seeing? What is both? Both, <laughs> but you know, logically, the problem will be there. If I just say right now, both, you, you take one, give me the other one. <laughs> you cannot. Yeah, there was a question there. In Samadhi, time stops. But why so much talk about Samadhi? We are not talking about Samadhi here. <laughs> See, people are fascinated by Samadhi. This seems to be some, okay, some nice philosophy. But Samadhi is the real thing to have. <laughs> I remember one young man came to the monastery in, in India for, for training as a monk, as a novice. He was a novice. And um, he uh, went through training and we were teaching Vedanta and... Uh, um, yoga and um, you know bhakti traditions and the life of Ramakrishna, Vivekananda, the teachings. So many things were being taught, Sanskrit grammar. And he said, oh, oh, fine, fine, good, good, good. Then puja was going to be taught, the actual worship, the ritualistic puja. And one part of it is pranayam. Pranayam is breathing techniques. So you sit straight, close this nose like this, breathe into the count of four from the other nose, one nose. No. Om, 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 om. Then close this nose. And hold the breath for 16 counts, then release for 8 counts on the other side, then hold it and bring it in for 4 counts, and one whole cycle of breathing, pranayama. Very basic pranayama. When it was start, this novice went, Wow, this is what I was here for. That's, that's kindergarten. This is, that's base camp. It's not that it's unspiritual or not necessary, it's good. 
but that's base camp and what you st just studied here is the peak of Mount Everest. Yeah. Ultimately what you're going to come to is this. I, I used to tell people, there are people who are not very enthused about Vedanta, but they liked, some liked festivals and rituals, some liked music, some liked sacred chanting, some liked meditation. I said, all of it is great. Some liked serving humanity, all of it is great. Just read it now, know what, what this teaches, and then put it aside. Go through life. When you are 80 years old, you'll again come back to this. Ultimately, <laughs> this is what is at the end of all of this, this seeking. Yeah. Oh, you asked a question about Samadhi. Uh, what was the question? Time. 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 No, time is not there. Just take the example of deep sleep. In deep sleep, is time there? In deep sleep, is time there? For you, subjectively. No. India. When you wake up, you see time has passed. When the person is outside there, who hears you snoring, for that person, time is not passing. <laughs> But for the person who is in deep sleep time, there is no time. Not that time is passing, no time. No experience of time passing. Only movement of the mind gives you the subjective experience of time. But Turiya, during the passage of time, when time is passing, when time is not passing, when you are terribly bored, when you are in Samadhi, when you are in deep concentration, when you are just doing your thing in life, Time is passing or not passing, Turiya is there equally at all times. Turiya transcends time. How does Turiya transcend time? Time is in Turiya. Turiya is not in time. Yes. With the three aspects in mind, would you classify Samadhi as uh, something like deep sleep? Something like deep sleep. Yeah. There are whole sections which distinguish Samadhi from deep sleep. But it's like deep sleep in the, in, the, in, that, that in the sense that there is no subject-object experience. And remember, what you are asking is nirvikalpa samadhi, the highest samadhi. Yeah. There are lower samadhis. Yeah. So when you focus on a deity, deity meditation, ishta devata, yeah. and you get a vision of the deity, that's called savikalpa samadhi. Those are states of extraordinary concentration and absorption. But they are all very well within the range of the mind. The highest one is where subject-object div division is obliterated. It is similar to deep sleep. But it is not deep sleep. There are many differences. Samadhi is a product of tamas. Slowness, inertia, darkness, laziness, sleepiness. Not samadhi, deep sleep. Samadhi is a product of sattva. Samadhi is a product of a very sattvic mind. A very serene, very alert mind. Tremendous alertness with tremendous calmness can lead to Samadhi. Vivekananda said, you go into deep sleep a fool and come out a fool. You go into Samadhi a fool, come out a, an enlightened person. So like that. There are many differences. I will come to you. Yes. Yeah, actually, I was just thinking about it. Samadhi is... is this. Again Samadhi. No, no, no. I, didn't, I, didn't mean to, I didn't mean to ask a question. Mm. I was just thinking that the, in the seventh mantra, now, Veda Prajnam is, is, made, is the Samadhi comes into that state. Yes, of, correct. Uh, correct. It is an important observation, he said. Clearly, the mantra says it is not Samadhi. Where? Where did it say that? Not something in between. It's not the waker, it's not the dream, it's not the deep sleeper, it's not God's omniscience, it is not unconsciousness also, and it is not any kind of Samadhi consciousness now. What comes and goes is not Turiya. Does Samadhi come and go? Certainly. If it did not come and go, why are you trying to attain it? What is this coming out of Samadhi then? That means Samadhi is gone. It goes away and becomes a memory. You talked about, you asked about enlightenment. Another uh, point, difference between enlightenment and everything else is, enlightenment never becomes a memory. Yeah. When you are seeing this and I ask you, see it as wood, are you referring to memory or are you seeing it here? You are seeing it here. Turiya is ever available. Samadhi can become a memory. There are people who have experienced it twice or thrice. Sri Ramakrishna experienced it twice or thrice every day. There are people who experience great sadhakas, who experience it twice or thrice in their whole life. I have met people. But the whole life, just twice or thrice, that's it. I know one monk who experienced genuine uh, Samadhi experience, maybe one of the lower Samadhis, but experienced that. 
but it's been um, at least he has not revealed anything further but the one he revealed to me was something that happened 60 years ago so yes it remains as a memory a tremendous memory a fantastic memory and very helpful very elevating can i give a short um, note on samadhi something i'll refer to you think about it there's no time to explain it we have run out of time this question of samadhi is fascinating and yet you will see it is conspicuous by its absence in this highest of texts it's not mentioned why not there is there's a great master called madhusudan saraswati who lived about 500 years ago he wrote a fantastic commentary on the bhagavad gita called gudhartha deepika a light on the hidden essence of the gita gudhartha deepika there in one of the verses i think in the 6th chapter or 4th chapter i forget suddenly he takes up this this question knowledge versus meditation gyan and samadhi he says there are these two paths to enlightenment both are paths to enlightenment and then he says for those who consider he, he says the followers of sankhya and yoga sankhya philosophy yoga philosophy who consider the world to be real a reality not an appearance in consciousness but a reality those who consider the world to be real there is no way out for them other than blanking out the experience of the world so samadhi is necessary for such people it's logical but then he says there is another category of seeker who can see the universe as an appearance of the consciousness they are for them they don't have to erase the appearance of the universe you can be awake you can dream you can sleep all can come and go yet you are the thurium everywhere you don't have to be it's a non meditation meditation yeah that you can sometimes it has been called sahaja samadhi natural samadhi so ramana maharshi and others are supposed to be in sahaja samadhi they are walking talking dealing with the world so are they like us waking dreaming deep sleep it seems so but a more accurate description of them they are always they know their turi identity they are a kind of samadhi which you might call sahaja natural samadhi sahaja means natural not a created samadhi through meditation techniques then madhusudan saraswati goes on to add for therefore our revered master shankaracharya he comes about 1000 years after shankaracharya therefore revered master shankaracharya has not taught samadhi for the followers of the path of vedanta not that is not useful it's useful vivekananda's conclusion we'll stop with that vivekananda's conclusion is they are all very useful these are subtle points and they they serve to clarify the difference between what is turiyam and samadhi the difference should be known and understood with clear clarity but after that it's not a condemnation of samadhi that would go too far so bhakti the samadhi of yoga the complete unselfishness of serving the world you know karma yoga and this philosophical inquiry which you find in the mandukya upanishad and other vedanta texts they all lead to the same goal ultimately they serve the same purpose uh, do it by vivekananda's words do it by philosophy do it by psychic control samadhi do it by love bhakti do it by work karma yoga by one or more or all of these and be free that is the goal books yeah. books temples churches they are all doctrines they are all secondary details all right let's end with the that uh, clip let's just listen to the seventh mantra He cannot be seen, grasped, bargained with. He is undefinable, unthinkable, 
indescribable. The only proof of his existence is union with him. The world disappears again. He is the peaceful, the good, the one without a second. This is the fourth condition of the self, the most worthy of all. This self, though beyond words, is that supreme word, O. Though indivisible, it can be divided in three letters corresponding to the three conditions of the self. The letter A, the letter U, and the letter M.
श्रीरामकृष्णाजपणमस्तू 